Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Sweat. I'm the author of Mayfly and Scorpion, and I'm here to tell you a scary story. Mayfly is set a hundred years in the future in a world where no one lives past the age of 17 and all the adults have died. Gemma and her boyfriend Apple are being chased by a group of people called the Last Lifers into the Hollywood Bowl. Only it doesn't look like the Hollywood Bowl. It looks like this. Gemma spies the letters then as she sees all of it at once. The first of the last lifers pouring off the hill, the 101 farther than she thought, too far to reach now and the forbidden gate in front of them. They're at the bowl. It's the place all the stories warn about, and they're going to have to enter it if they want to live. She can't move, even though she knows she must. Apple pulls her shoulders toward him. Time to meet our ghosts, he says. Somehow his gentleness makes her feet budge where the last lifers couldn't and they're past the gate and into the terror that seems to close in on them. None of the Hollywood have ever entered the bowl, even though they can see it from the ridge. It's not that they don't dare, although they certainly do not. It's that every taboo, every confusing, conflicting legend agrees on this. Stay out of the bowl. It should smell, she thinks. She thought it would smell of death and worse. But even, even as she wonders how long the smell lasts, she does sniff something the scent of the pines that line their path. Then she thinks it's far more beautiful than she could have imagined, with ponderosas thick and green and pine needles up to her ankles. But then a final turn and it opens up before her and it is worse. It is so much worse. She sees immediately how the bowl got its name, like a giant scoop from the hillside. Seats climb the walls of the bowl. At the bottom is a platform and a kind of shelter like a clamshell. She couldn't have even thought of how the parents used it, except the old stories used to say that they sang here. The Hollywood Bowl, they called it. It doesn't matter, though, because everywhere she looks are bodies. Draped over chairs, tossed roughly into walkways, piled seven deep, tangled arm over leg over head, the bowl filled with them. This is a place where the future came to its end. We found the parents, Apple says. The parents used to bury their dead, but when the end came, they died so quickly that there was no one left to bury them. All the children could do was drag their parents into the bowl and leave them there to rot. Now the children burn their dead the day they die. Now, she thinks, we're all orphans. There is nowhere to hide among the bones and smiling skulls. They climb midway up the bowl before they hear the shrieks of the last lifers. Gemma looks around, panicked for some kind of hole. Help me, she whispers to whatever God will hear. Crunches of bones at the bottom. The crackling cries grow louder. Help us, she says, the fear rising. Show us where to hide. And, and something does. There's a buzz in her ears like the beginning of a headache. And then it recedes. In the silence, a blue haze floats down over the bowl, like scattered ash at first, then brighter and brighter like stars. She worries that the last lifers will see it, but even Apple doesn't seem to notice. The haze swirls in clouds around her until it takes the form of children. It's showing me the last lifers about to attack, she realizes. Not in perfect images. The edges of the last lifers are blurry, as if the haze doesn't know how to draw bodies. The hazy visions come toward her. When she looks back up the hill, this time the haze shows a passageway under the bones. One of the benches has been dug out by a coyote. A burrow of bones. It's invisible to her real eyes. In the haze, though, the last life her figures seem to walk right past it without noticing. Gemma hesitates. Is it safe? Then she thinks. Well, you asked for help from the gods. It'd be rude not to take it. She leads Apple straight to where the burrow should be. She moves two skulls and it's there. Under a long bench, under the body, so there is a pocket big enough to hold them both. Gemma crawls under, followed by Apple. Did you see that, she says, but Apple looks at her blankly. She shakes her head, but a loud bone crack below stops her next sentence. Apple slides up behind her as she lies down on her side, staring out into the bones. The smell of ancient death settles upon them. She can hear the last life her calls as they divide and scale the sides of the bowl. They sound wild, like lions or bears, but neither. A bear never talked or thought or loved like they did, so in those cries are everything lost and abandoned. Gemma finds something strange pushing aside the fear. 
Sadness for Andy, the 10-year-old who loved the long-gone cars, the 13-year-old who dove off the bare wall first. She breathes hard and sharp, and Apple mistakes it for panic. He wraps his arm around her waist, threads his leg between hers, till their hips and shoulders and breath match, and her head nestles under his chin. For the first time since they ran down the stack, she feels a flash of calm. When she was seven, she hid from the olders and the others looked for her. Apple found her under a table, crying. Instead of pulling her out, he put his fingers to his lips and climbed under. Gemma is aware of every place where Apple's skin touches hers. Her skin seems to heat on contact and spread until all those places are linked, as if he's touching her everywhere. He feels it too, because he presses his fingers wide across her belly. We can't be feeling this here, among all this death, with people haunting us, she thinks. And yet, why not? Isn't it part of surviving? She can see windows of the sky through the lattice of phones before her, but can't see down any deeper into the bowl. Someone is two rows down, stomping the skeletons as if they're dry wood. The cracks shoot through the still air. Footsteps fall in the row, and she can't help shaking until Apple's stillness draws the shivers out of her. Three people, just like in the haze. The feet crunch closer, 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 in front of her eyes, and then they're past. She doesn't breathe. Then they fade away. The buzz comes back, and then the haze does suddenly, as if it's just popping in for something they forgot to tell her. In the dots of the haze, she can see Andy's face, those empty eyes. The haze can't quite draw his features, but she recognizes the pain in him. Is it real? Is Andy coming back for them? I think they're gone, Apple says. Wait, she says. They wait long moments, listening for the sounds. Maybe Apple's right, but a smaller foot set of footsteps start again toward them. She feels Apple tense to reach for his machete, but he can't swing it properly while he's wrapped around Gemma. Her fingers reach for her hatchet, but she's not quite there, and she doesn't know if she could bear to swing it. And then a foot smashes away the bone in front of her face, and it's Andy's face, but not. Andy's lost in eyes, rimmed with coal, reaching in to tear them apart. Andy. Apple says calmly, probably seeing that Andy doesn't have room to swing his spear under the bench. It's us, your friends. Andy hesitates for a moment, life flashing across his eyes before flickering out, and Gemma swings the hatchet, buries it deep into his skull. He collapses without a whimper, with a face as clear and confused as a baby. Gemma pulls out the hatchet, wipes it off, carefully, but her hands shake so much that she's worried she'll cut herself. They huddle close together in silence, hoping that no one heard Andy fall. We ain't meant for this, Apple whispers. You're almost 17, she says. How do you keep a living? You just gotta remember what it's like to be alive. They make their way down through the bowl, the only children to visit the parents.